Hello, I'm Ron and welcome to Popsicle where I talk about popular culture, science, and everything in between. Today we'll be talking about something very interesting which is sci-fi sex and reproduction. Reproduction is very very important in biology on Earth and probably elsewhere. Uh, it is the primary drive of organisms to be able to reproduce and thus pass on their genetic material to the next generation. This is what maintains and allows lineages to survive families to survive, but ultimately species and populations also to survive. Without reproduction, without successful reproduction, there could be no maintenance of a population. And we, we remember that the population is the level at which evolution takes place. And also recall that for a trait to be subject to evolution, it has to be heritable. So we can see here the importance of sex and reproduction in general in not only passing on the genes of the parent to the offspring and thus continuing the proliferation of particular genetic material, but also the proliferation and maintenance of entire populations. It's important to remember that a population is essentially defined as a group of individuals of the same species living together and interbreeding. And we can also see how important reproduction is from such species definitions as the biological species concept, which defines a species as a group of organisms that can mate and produce fertile offspring. Although that particular species concept is quite limited to sexually reproducing organisms. But essentially, we can see with all of these things how important reproduction is. And that's why sexual selection is also very important, particularly in sexually reproducing organisms. And if the name sounds familiar, the term sexual selection, that's because it sounds like natural selection or invokes the idea of natural selection. And it's not far off. Sexual selection is, in essence, natural selection that arises from competition for mates and mating opportunities. Now, when we talk about reproduction in both real life and in science fiction, there are two general types, and you probably know this. You have asexual and sexual reproduction. In basic terms, asexual reproduction is when there's no uh, involvement of gametes, male and female gametes, where the male gamete fertilizes the female gamete. So you have a lot of different methods of asexual reproduction, fission being one of the most popular ones. Essentially, the organism just splitting into two. This is common in bacteria single-celled eukaryotes, and several other very simple organisms. You also have fragmentation of, or, or budding, which are uh, quite similar. You have a fragment or a bud of an organism falling off and becoming an entirely different individual. And this is typical of a lot of different invertebrates, like the Nidarians. Now, regardless of the type of a sexual reproduction scene, this is a type of biological cloning, a natural cloning, because the offspring is genetically identical to the parent. And that is because there is no mixing of genetic material during a sexual reproduction, unlike in sexual reproduction where there is. And that's one of the key differences between the two. In sexual reproduction, there is the involvement of gametes, sperm and egg, typically. And the formation of the sperm and the egg in the body of the organism that bears these gametes involves a mixing of genetic material from both parents. And that's what introduces the genetic variation, that process of genetic recombination or shuffling. Ultimately, the gametes will fertilize each other. Specifically, of course, the sperm will fertilize the egg, thus producing an individual that is a combination in, in terms of genetics, in terms of trait, of its two parents. It will not look exactly like just one parent because of the process by which fertilization occurs. And that is... Reproduction, in general, as you know it on Earth, of course, there are many exciting things about reproduction, not only in science fiction, actually, but in real life. One thing to note of is that even on Earth, there are many bizarre types of reproduction. Let me give you a few interesting examples. In, in uh, a lot of hermaphroditic slug species, you have a sort of contest between two organisms that have both sexes. That's why they're called hermaphroditic or monoecious. And essentially, they do fencing with their penises or their penile uh, organs. And uh, 
the one that loses that contest will have to receive the sperm and have its eggs fertilized. That's quite common in uh, some slug species that are hermaphroditic. And then you also have the anglerfish. You're probably familiar with this example where the female is much, much larger than the male. The male's only function essentially is to uh, to deliver sperm to the female. When reproduction is about to occur, the male will attach itself to the female, lose its identity as, indiv as an individual. It will become essentially an appendage of the female and its only role will be to give out sperm to fertilize the eggs of the female. And finally, uh, another bizarre example. This is probably the one that that is, that is uh, least known, but it's in my book one of the most bizarre and one of the most interesting. There's a particular animal called a velvet worm, where in in some particular species only, not all, but in some species, what the male does is it puts its sperm uh, on the female's back. And the sperm literally eat their way through the skin of the female to gain access to the gametes of the female inside. Biologists don't know really how this baffling behavior evolved in the first place and what its significance is, but that's something that we see. So you don't really need to look at sci-fi or go to sci-fi to be able to see bizarre forms of sex and reproduction. However, Sci-fi, of course, takes those things on a different level. Uh, and, and I'm sure you can think of several examples. We will go through some. There's one particular uh, type of reproduction that is seen even on Earth that is reflected in quite a bit of science fiction. This is what you call parthenogenesis, which is essentially a type of asexual reproduction. And it's characterized by the fact that it arises from sexual reproduction. Now, as you probably know, organisms started off being asexually uh, reproducing. Sexual reproduction arose evolutionarily from asexually reproducing organisms. But in some sexually reproducing lineages of animals and other organisms, asexual reproduction returned in some form, and this form is parthenogenesis, where there's already males and females, but in some species, the females have evolved to be able to produce offspring without need for fertilization of their egg cells by sperm. And they do this through mitosis, essentially. Well, there are several forms of parthenogenesis, actually. But in general, the egg cell is able to produce offspring on its own. In some species that are parthenogenetic, there's no male at all. All offspring are female. In those that do have males, Males are produced normally through parthenogenesis. Females are produced through sexual reproduction. So there's that uh, there's that different type of parthenogenesis. Now I'll mention several sci-fi texts that show this. So it seems that parthenogenesis is a very fascinating thing for science fiction authors. And I'm sure you can think of examples also. The xenomorph is one very good example. If you listen to the director's cut and the commentaries on, on the on the recent releases of the franchise films, then you will find out that the xenomorph is canonically parthenogenetic. The alien queen, the xenomorph queen, can produce eggs on her own without need for being fertilized by the male xenomorphs. Another example is in Octavia Butler's award-winning short story, Bloodchild. Um, you have the click, which are gigantic insectoid or centipede-like uh, intelligent race which has uh, built ghettos uh, for humans on their planet. Presumably the humans came from Earth and, uh, and are migrated to this particular planet but instead of having a dominant role which we're used to seeing in sci-fi, they're subservient to the native clique who are essentially using them as uh, carriers of their offspring and it's it's not in vitro fertilization as you would as you would think or just using the female as a surrogate in in the ways we do here on earth it's much more bizarre and much more disturbing because uh, the the tick practice a form of behavior called the parasitoid behavior 
which you've probably heard of as what wasps do on Earth. Wasps, not all, but a lot of wasps, lay their eggs inside the body of other insects by piercing them with that sharp part of their abdomen called the ovipositor and, and essentially uh, injecting the eggs into the other animal. The click do that to humans. And the humans barely have a choice because that's part of the agreement that they have. So it's a very, very interesting short story, not only in terms of the bizarre reproduction, but also in terms of gender roles. Because typically, the ones that are impregnated in this way are the males, the male humans, for various reasons. So I encourage you to read Blood Child by Octavia Butler. And one more interesting uh, example of parthenogenesis in sci-fi is the Asari from Mass Effect. And those of you who've played Mass Effect would be, I'm sure, fascinated, very, very fascinated with, with Asari. They are a, a, a very interesting race. They are seen by most races in Mass Effect as all female, although they themselves wouldn't normally uh, uh, describe themselves as being all female. In fact, they're, they're, you can you can say that they're monosexual. They have they have just one sex. There's only one sexual state. But it's not as if you can really call them male or female from uh, a universal perspective. Although they do look female to the eyes of most other intelligent species like having, uh, having breasts and having uh, the voice that is typically associated with females. Now what makes these Asari very interesting is that they practice a form of parthenogenesis. But it's not as simple as that. They do need mates. Whether an Asari mate or a mate from any other intelligent humanoid species. And what happens during the sex is a type of melding, what they call a melding, where there's no exchange of genetic material, not really. There's no gametic exchange either. And that's why it's not true sexual reproduction. What happens is that Two copies of the gene of the Asari, the female Asari, are passed on to her offspring. One copy is unaltered, but one copy is altered by the melding process, wherein the female actually merges her nervous system and her consciousness with her partner. And this process sort of epigenetically changes the genetic material of that gene copy to have a combination of the Asari genes and some of, somehow the genetic material of the partner, thus producing an Asari offspring. It's always an Asari offspring, but with certain characteristics from the other parent. So it's very interesting. It's parthenogenesis, and yet it's not. But that's what sci-fi is, and uh, that's one of the the probably the the examples that you thought of if you've ever uh, played Mass Effect. Now, I suppose it's worth noting that assimilation is another method by which alien species usually reproduce. This can be a very terrifying type of reproduction because it's usually forced with the alien species forcing a merging with the host species through parasitism, for instance, or putting its egg inside another organism in, in, in typical parasitoid behavior like what the xenomorphs and the click do. You have Typically, these are insectoid races. You'd remember the Zerg from StarCraft doing this. The Tyranids from Warhammer. The, the Brood from the X-Men universe. Uh, and these are all true reproduction because there's assimilation not, not only physically but also genetically. The offspring incorporate genetic material from the host. Now, there are several types of assimilation in science fiction that are not true reproduction because there's no exchange of gametes and genetic material. And I can think of two examples right away in science fiction. You have the Cybermen in Doctor Who. Assimilation is their thing, right? And the Borg from Star Trek. Uh, th these two are very similar. Uh, they're, they're very robotic and they have a hive mind and their, their, their thing really is to incorporate or to assimilate other races into their own but it's not true reproduction again because there's no exchange of genetic material it's just for increasing their number which is one of the uh, primary 
objectives of reproduction. Another interesting thing that comes up in discussions when talking about reproduction in science fiction is the role of hybrids. Hybrids are produced when you have two different species mating with each other and somehow producing offspring. Now on Earth, this is not very common unless it's forced, unless it's artificial like the liger, for example. In, in nature, typically two species will not mate with each other because they have become reproductively isolated. They do not attract each other. And there are reproductive barriers between them, either physical, which immediately removes the possibility of sex, like for example, the two genitals not being able to fit, or it can be a post-mating barrier, in which case sex can be possible, but then the offspring are usually not viable. Like for example, the offspring are typically sterile, especially the males. Now, in science fiction, we see this a lot. For example, in Star Trek, it's quite common. There have been a lot of characters, minor characters, that, uh, that are hybrids. Uh, half Romulan, half Vulcan, half, half Klingon. Uh, and of course, the most popular one is Spock himself. Spock is half human, half Vulcan. So, in Earth biology, Spock being a male hybrid of two very, very distantly related species, and we say distantly loosely, if we refer to the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Chase, where it's, it's implied that a lot of intelligent species in the Star Trek universe, including humans and possibly and then Vulcans also, come from the same genetic material through panspermia from the progenitor race. Then we are closely related we are related to each other somehow. But we're talking about, of course, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of years of separate evolution. So so it's too distant. So we can say that yes, given the given the similarity in anatomy, uh, Vulcans and humans will probably be able to mate and might be able to produce offspring. I don't know how many chromosomes Vulcans have. That's going to be a, a sticking a, a problematic point. Um, however, we do have Spock. We don't know if Spock is sterile. There's non-canonical text uh, that says he he produced an offspring. In canon, I don't think he did, or I don't think he has an offspring, um, regardless of whether he is sterile or not. But biologically speaking, he probably is, and most hybrids probably are. However, in Star Trek, it's spec it's 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 implied uh, that uh, they are not, in fact, sterile. Hybrids can produce offspring. Uh, the farther away two species are from each other in terms of evolutionary time like the farther away they split up from a common lineage the less likely they are to be able to produce fertile offspring or viable offspring for that matter but that hasn't stopped science fiction authors from producing a lot of hybrids because when you have multiple intelligent species that are humanoid in appearance that are vaguely similar to each other encountering each other in common space there's probably going to be a lot of attraction going on there and ensuing reproduction and a lot of hybrids so actually there's a lot to talk about in science fiction sex and reproduction but i guess that suffices for now i hope that has encouraged you to read and watch the texts that i've referred to and to explore more of these things in science fiction so if you enjoyed that video and learned from it and you would like to see more of similar content and you would like to learn more about popular culture, science, and everything in between, don't forget to subscribe to Popsicle so that you may be alerted to new content. See you again next time!